1906, three separate police forces existed in Nigeria. These were the Lagos Police Force, the Northern Region Police Force and the Southern Region Police Force. In the second half of 1906, the colony and protectorate of Lagos was matched with the protectorate of Southern Nigeria. In 1914, the colony and protectorate of Southern Nigeria and the protectorate of Northern Nigeria were merged to form the colony and protectorate of Nigeria. However, the Southern and Northern Nigeria police forces remained separate until 1930 when they were merged to form the current NPF. Thus, on 1st April 1930, what we have today as a Nigerian police force came into existence with Lagos as headquarters. Colonial authorities established and used the colonial police as tools to suppress and subjugate the local populations against opposition to colonial incursion into Nigerian territories and to advance colonial political and economic interests. Nigeria, at independence in 1960, inherited the culture and institutions of the colonial police. Sixteen years after the eventual restoration of democratic processes in Nigeria, with the general election of 1999 and despite huge resources committed to police reform, police abuse and corruption remain widespread in Nigeria. A culture of impunity protects perpetrators of police abuse, leaving victims with little or no access to redress and justice. Police abuse in Nigeria has a social class bias targeting mainly the poor and vulnerable social groups. For example, police often arrest commercial sex workers at night and extort money and or sexual gratification before releasing them. A senior police officer in Lagos told Noprin researchers in 2006 that arresting commercial sex workers at night and raping them is a fringe benefit attached to night patrol. Police are not transparent and accountable in their treatment of suspects, and this affects public confidence. Public perception of the police is very poor. The next thing we saw was a publication. They had paraded my brother as an informant of kidnappers. No point was he mentioned again what they told us that he was in possession of police AK-47. Then I was trying to say to them, well, you said he was in possession of AK-47. Now the story is that he's an informant to kidnappers. And it was as if I was annoying them, asking questions. And the next thing the guy said was that, Madam, I read psychology. I know what you want to say. I know what you want. Just go home and take care of yourself. That your brother's case will serve as a lesson. That I don't know what he meant by that, but the time he goes around the whole country and returns, if he returns, then he will, serve, he will learn his lesson. Of course, I broke down there. I started crying. Suspects and persons accused of crime are often mistreated in police custody. Persons in custody are often denied legal and human rights, often detained incommunicado and denied access to family, lawyers and doctors. I was looking into that Rikethi home. My hands were banned. I also want to remember it in form of a, a Christmas barbecue. If you have seen a goat that is a hand for Xmas celebration. Your, hand, your two hands will be tied, your two legs will be tied. You will now be suspended on an, an elevated beam. And that is when you will start realizing that uh, you are the person who killed your grandfather. Meanwhile, your grandfather is very much alive. Um, you will go through this process in such a way that when you pass out, they will pour you water. At some point, one of them said, I think he was most humane, the, 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 the second in command of the OCSAS, said that uh, this guy, from what you, because I was writing a statement along the way, they said my statement was too academic, listing all the schools I attended to all. So that Mr. Man dropped that. Tell us what happened. What happened is that somebody came and dropped something in the hotel and they left. And by the time he left, then the police arrived immediately. I repeated this over and over again. And as often as you repeat it, then you keep receiving the torture. At some point, we are naked. So when you pass out, they will pour water. 
and the way you became yourself. The questions are repeated in such a format that, of course, that was an open world. Torture was going down here. Torture was going down here. Torture was there. You, when we entered, we already saw people who were undergoing the experience, so you start expecting your own. So by the time we were there, you also hear it was terrible. We were there, we had tons of bullets, as in one boy was being touched. I don't know what he did, but they had to kind of. Wrongful law enforcement approach deny the police public support and affect police community relations and undermines the development of a constructive partnership in communities. Long years of neglect and abuse by successive governments have rendered the police incapable of effectively discharging their constitutional duties and social functions to the people. A compromised recruitment process has left the force with a poorly trained and badly paid workforce prone to corruption and violence. Consequently, the police face public contempt, derision, ridicule, hostility and sometimes violence. Lack of political will for genuine police reform, poor funding, lack of equipment for police operations, poor training in human rights, intelligence and investigation, and low morale as a result of poor working conditions hamper police effectiveness in providing public safety and security and facilitate police abuse, corruption and misconduct. Police welfare is very poor. Remunerations and insurance benefits are poor and retirement benefits are also denied. The face housing, healthcare and recreational challenges. Senior officers are relatively better housed than the junior officers, derisively characterized as rank and file. These ones make do with accommodation that could be described as subhuman. Most junior officers are housed in one-room apartments, sharing dilapidated facilities with others. The housing types provided vary from state to state. Even within states, it varies according to the location of the command. Those in cities where the pressure on police housing stock is higher have poorer accommodations, while those located in provincial areas are better accommodated. The continuous recruitment of officers without upgrading and expanding facilities have created new challenges of accommodation for police planners. New barracks are not built to accommodate the new recruits, thus worsening the already precarious accommodation crisis in police barracks. A substantial number of police officers live outside the barracks due to shortage of living spaces in the barracks. Most police barracks are eyesores and negatively impact on the well-being, morale and attitude of police personnel in the way they interact with citizens. You will be amazed at what you will see when you pay a visit to most of the Nigerian police barracks. Dilapidated buildings, stinking and disease-infested gutters, broken staircases and railings, torn roofs, heaps of garbage and many other unpleasant spectacles in what clearly depicts neglect and squalor. These are what you will see. From the police barracks in Apapa, known as Queen's Barracks, to Mobile 2 Barracks in GRA Ikeja, Ikmori Barracks, Area C Command Barracks close to Juelegba on Funcho Williams Avenue, and Police Training College Barracks in Ikeja. Lagos State Criminal Investigation Department, SCID, popularly known as Kwanti Police Station Barracks, Yaba, Lagos. All the barracks bear resemblances of themselves, except perhaps the Alausa Barracks opposite the Lagos State Secretariat. The big question is, how will Nigerians expect anything good from police officers who live in these kinds of squalid environment? As I said, this barrack is as old as Nigeria, and with my knowledge, I heard the barrack was renovated once. That was in 1970-something, mm. you can see. So this is to, to prove to you that those that are in charge of, uh, those, the community that are in charge of police welfare, they are not doing their job.
As you walk around these barracks, what comes to mind is that perhaps there's a correlation between the bizarre attitude of these men and women in black and the kind of environment they live in. There is a solution, but the thing is, it now depends on the the, uh, the, the the committee that was set up to look into to look into the rehabilitation of the barracks. If the if they are able to join us together with some other groups and groups within the bar, because most of the people that we have been set up to look into the bar welfare, they are people that they some of them doesn't live in the bar, they doesn't know what it takes that to live in the bar, how to make how the people reside in the bar to maintain their environment. So if you set up a committee, a majority of them does not stay in the bar, they won't have the experience or they won't know what it is it takes to. To, uh, to sanitize the environment. So it is only when we, we have the partner, because I believe they, we have the uh, police officer's wife association, they have the environmental committee, and in Ipoca too, we have our own committee. So if they can join us together with these three groups, I believe there will be a solution to, to all, uh, all this uh, environmental uh, uh, pollution we have within the barracks. A visit to Mumpo 2 barracks near the Lagos Police Command Headquarters GRA Ikeja reviews scary pictures of buildings which have been left unmaintained for a long time. The roofs are removed, the panes are washed off, and the staircases are ugly spectacles to behold. Most of the railings are removed, thereby exposing the inhabitants, particularly the children, to danger. Also, the soccerways are broken and the contents exposed. Here, one sees human waste and dirty water everywhere, making the environment unfit for healthy living. Open gutters, which are breeding abodes for mosquitoes, also expose the police officers and their families to frequent malaria attack and other life-threatening infections. Then I was two years old, so my mom had to bring me back to Lagos to join the husband and my dad, you know, we were together uh, in a Kwari police barrack, room 24. That was our room in a Kwari police barrack. And I remember uh, vividly that, you know, growing up, you know, all my uh, dad's siblings and uh, my mom's siblings, all of them, it was a room and parlor uh, apartment, you know, self-contained now. And they were all rammed into that room because everybody wants to be there because it's so much joy, so much happiness, you enjoy it, you know. And I remember we had a, a, a field, we had somewhere we called a field there, and there's a village called Ademuiwa village. So, and they had a ballet then. So people from Ademuiwa, they would come to that field, then we in the barracks, the barracks, we go to that field again, you know, we play ball, you know, we do all sorts of things. And on Saturday, Saturday is our laundry day. In the morning, very early, as early as 6 a.m., all of us, we are all in the laundry. The water system is perfect, okay, we are all there, we washing and all those things. Those are the things we do. And I remember the uniform then was khaki, you know, the khaki and they put on the socks, you know, almost uh, roll it, or get it to the knee, and the black shoe. And I remember when we want to polish the shoe, what we do is, the polish that was raining there was kiwi polish. So we use the kiwi, we cut the wool into the water, soak it, put it, uh, dry it again, then put the kiwi polish, then begin to rub it on the shoe. And then after that, you rub it on the belt too, then you leave it for about, you know, for hours. You know, after washing and everything, you go back to it, then you begin to shine. When after shining it, they put it back into the sun. And I am tell you that by the time you are done with it, you know that you have a clean, a clean shoe. And it's um, the washing. What do we do is we use a lot of starch. So and we wash, you know, wash and wash and wash, put starch, dry it. And when it gets to like 2, 3 p.m., then we now begin to iron. We iron. And it used to be a competition amongst children or policemen. It was not surprising that wives of police officers under the ages of Police Officers' Wives Association, POWA, at Ikmori, Lagos, recently cried out to the authorities, drawing attention to the sorry state of their abode. It is important to examine the impact of police budgets on the welfare of police officers in Nigeria by examining variables like weapons, other equipment, housing, medical facilities, education, and crime rates.
On paper, a sizable chunk of police budgets are spent on acquiring modern weapons, but nothing could be further from the truth in reality. Most policemen are armed with varieties of weapons, ranging from the outdated Kalashnikovs to pump-action rifles. These weapons, apart from the menacing manner the police carry them about all the time in the public, are also grossly unworthy and inadequate for effective policing. They dampen the morale and confidence of police officers and hamper their effectiveness when they come in contact with the superior firepower of bandits. Ammunitions for these weapons are also rationed for the police officers, ensuring that the police cannot engage armed bandits with almost limitless supplies of ammunition in prolonged gun battles without suffering casualties. This mainly accounts for the unacceptably high casualty rate among police officers. Police officers are major targets of armed criminals who often have better guns, ammunition and better intelligence and tactics. They drive better and faster cars than the police and have better incentives. Any wonder then that they typically outman, outgun and outsmart the police? Policemen are being killed, banks are being attacked, money is being stolen without any action taken. The federal government have tried their best for Nigerian police ever since the civilians of civilian since 1999. What tells you they are? In terms of remuneration, they are highly remunerated. Yes, police at the present, they are highly remunerated to the extent that even the OC stars you mentioned that time, Put in a physical room that got millions of naira at police headquarters. But yet, police team is built on the road. That's what I do. That's the area. Maybe would you identify which area we're we talking about about the police? That they are healing this and that. No. They are well equipped. You see brand new cars, state government keep buying, everybody keep buying. But people still complain about police attitude. Then I think police need to search their mind. In house, this issue of returns, that's the only problem I have with police. If that thing is abolished, we'll get a better police police winning in Nigeria. Other equipment and accessories are in the same shabby state. Most police divisions, stations and outposts have no serviceable vehicles. The motor transport pools and the maintenance yards are full of scrapped police vehicles with no spare parts to put them back on the road. Where such vehicles are available, there will be no fuel to drive them to operational purposes most of the time. Boots uniforms, belts and barrettes are not regularly issued and this explains the shabby and disgraceful appearance of most Nigerian police officers. It is also a known fact that police officers sometimes have to buy their uniforms either from their own store men or from the open markets. It is also obvious that most private security guards are better turned out than the Nigerian police officers. Salaries and allowances. The remuneration and other benefits of Nigerian police officers are too poor compared to what police officers are paid in many other countries, including African countries. The poor remuneration is also lopsided against junior officers. Senior officers are relatively better paid than junior officers. Studies have shown that the average military officer receives about four times what the average police officer of equivalent rank receives. The poor take home has often been cited by police officers as reason for their indulgence in criminal activities like extortion, bribe for bail and collusion with criminal elements in the society. The poor salaries and allowances paid to police officers appear to reinforce and lock them into the poverty cycle since they are not able to save enough from their salaries to ensure a better future for themselves and their families. Increase in salary has not yet addressed their needs and grievances. Operational capabilities are still very low and the police have no answers to increasing crime rate across the country. I I tend to agree with everybody, but you know there's, there's 
to get success out of any community and organization, it has to be a two-way thing. The leadership as well as the followership. I think for a fact, and I tend to disagree with most people, I've been around to a few countries too, and I know that um, it's not as perfect as we tend to see, like people project them to be, even in America. <laughs> so sometimes we have this opinion that yes, you know, it's a stable system, everybody's up. We always have the bad eggs, everywhere. As much as yes, the Nigerian police is faulty and people are complaining. I think the attitude of we individuals have a lot to influence and affect the attitude towards us. It is interesting, however, to note that the Nigerian police personnel perform creditably better and are highly regarded on foreign assignments where they are better resourced. It is very rare to hear of Nigerian police personnel demanding bribe, charging money for bail, getting drunk while on duty, or demanding bribe from motorists while on foreign missions. It is also rare to hear of any case of accidental discharge by any Nigerian police personnel outside of Nigeria. This could be attributed to the conducive environment and the adequate remuneration they receive while on foreign assignments. The fear of losing this legal source of income and being returned home is enough incentive to keep our police officers on foreign mission in check and stop their usual antics while on foreign assignment. Medical facilities. Medical facilities available to police officers are generally inadequate compared with the armed forces. As a result of the deplorable state of police medical facilities in Nigeria, most senior police officers patronize private hospitals or travel abroad while junior officers make do with quarks. Drugs are irregularly supplied, and when they are supplied, such drugs tend to disappear magically from the medical stores only to reappear in private pharmacies owned by some of the medical personnel or their relatives. Crime in the barracks Most police barracks in Nigeria are havens of crime. Criminal acts are not limited to police officers alone. Their children and dependents are also more involved. The most common crimes include burglary pilfering and selling of police kits and equipments, selling of controlled substances, rape and procurement of women for prostitution and vandalization of buildings. The high crime rate in the police barracks is inevitable because of the poor welfare situation. Poor police public relations. Due to poor public order policing approaches, police often clash with civic groups such as students, labor unions, etc. It is therefore not uncommon that university students, labor unions, angry mobs, and even soldiers on vengeance often target the police and their stations. Not even the politicians care about the police. They only find the police useful when they want to use them to rig election, harass and intimidate their opponents, or as bodyguards or errand boys for their wives and girlfriends. Often, they have been publicly attacked by angry mob. You cannot have a viable democracy with strong institutions without law and order. And at the heart of democracy and strong institutions are the police who are charged to maintain public order and peace, enforce law and order, detect investigate and prevent crimes and enforce judicial decisions. Tom O'Connor, quoting Heman Goldstein, 1977, said that the functions of a modern police force are to prevent and control conduct that are threatening to the life and property, to aid individuals who are in danger of physical harm, such as the victims of violent attack to facilitate the movement of people and vehicles, to assist those who cannot care for themselves, the intoxicated, the addicted, the mentally ill, the physically disabled, the old and the young, to resolve conflicts, whether it be between individuals, groups or individuals, 
or individuals and their government to identify problems that have the potential for becoming more serious problems and to create and maintain a feeling of security in communities. While there is no doubt that the Nigerian police have not lived up to its universal charge, however, the blame cannot be laid at their doorstep alone. The police do not write laws. The legislature makes laws. The police do not hire and promote officers. The Police Service Commission is charged with the powers of recruitment, promotion and discipline. The police do not make budgetary allocations. The Ministry of Police Affairs is in charge of budgets and procurement. What this means is that the police lack the necessary political support and oversight for effective performance and good conduct. This is in addition to brazen mismanagement or outright theft and diversion of funds meant for police operation. Such police equipment funds and other strategic operational funds as we witness quite often. Too many things the police have to know. They must build in every state capital a forensic laboratory. Take graduates there, engineers, biologists, doctors, chemists, experts in biology, all this must be made available. And then to have in each state somebody who will be like deputy commissioner of police in charge of those people, not to be just left with commissioner of police. Because some of them, when they join police as graduates and they become ASP, their colleagues will become commissioners of police over them and they will still be chief superintendent. Those are the things that must be looked into. Administrative reorganization. So I advise that the police be reorganized completely. Not that we have more policemen than necessary. We don't have enough but better training for them, to train them, to control the crowd, to gather intelligence as they were in the old E branch. The present government wants on the Nigerian police, which has not been there from all the panel they have been setting up and all the suggestions, the, what they need is one change of attitude on the middle cadre and the junior cadre in the Nigerian police force, and some few bad eggs at the top hierarchy. And the pol government to fully fund and support the police. And finally, the Nigerian public to cooperate. Police has no magic. There is no magic in crime detection and um, provision of adequate, ideal, and secure security. No magic. It is the cooperation of the populace that will encourage them to record success. That is the truth. As Professor Etanibi Alimika said, police constitute the face of government. Police cannot be my friend until government is my friend. We cannot have the police we deserve if we don't have the government we deserve. The police cannot be my friend or the government is my friend because we want to always do the bidding of government. So as we talk about what to do with the police, we should not essentially lose society. We should not lose, uh, this, uh, lose sight of the fact that we cannot have the police we deserve if we continue to have a government that we do not deserve. As we look forward to a major restructuring and reorganization of the Nigerian police force, we expect greater commitment and political will on the part of President Buhari to implement the various reforms recommended by various government committees on police reform and the civil society panel on police reform, which in 2012 submitted its own report to former President Jonathan. The police must be depoliticized and the president must show the courage and support of a constitutional amendment to remove operational control from the executive and vest it in the inspector general of police who is the professional in the field. 
the procedure for the appointment of the Inspector General of Police must be made more inclusive, participatory and transparent to enable public input into the process through a legislative public hearing. The Inspector General of Police must enjoy fixed term and security of tenure and some operational autonomy to act impartially, professionally and effectively. The Inspector General of Police must be accountable to multiple constituencies, including the law, the executive and the people through representative structures to enhance independence, impartiality and professionalism. The process of recruitment must be transparent and devoid of corruption to ensure that qualified candidates are recruited. Training must be based on human rights and must cover areas such as intelligence and investigation, including forensic science to discourage crude approach to police investigation. Remuneration and insurance packages must be adequate to enhance the commitment and dedication of police officers towards the discharge of their duties because lack of commitment has been identified as the bane of the police profession. There must be an effective punishment and reward system in the police. The community will only be encouraged to partner with the police if the community is convinced that the police are truly their friends, if they do not prey on them but protect and provide services to them. To change the police, we have to change the police doctrine and philosophy as well as a national orientation and values. In order for the police to serve and protect with integrity, we must provide for them both the tools and the dignity they deserve. We must provide qualified and competent leadership. We cannot have the police we deserve unless we have the government we deserve. This message is from Noprin committed to promoting police accountability and respect for human rights and the humanization of the police service.